dare great things for Christ. Christ calls us to dare great things. In the marketplace, as well as in the mission field, there has never been a time like the present for the spirit of the Catholic entrepreneur. Now is the time for men and women of great courage and great vision to engage our church and our culture. Now is the time to dare great things. And here is your host as we dare great things, Father Nathan Cromley, the president and founder of the St. John Institute. When it comes to leadership, what we do on the outside flows from what we have on the inside. Our thoughts and our motivations drive the actions which determine our success. Here, Christians have a distinct advantage. Ever since Christ rose from the dead, Christians know the truth about our final victory over evil and therefore our daily victory over problems. In this seventh of our series on the Christian Leadership Advantage, we explore the Christian power of positivity. Hey everybody, so glad to be back with you again and it's a chance to have a real deep understanding of the power that Christian faith brings to us in our leadership. And I, one of the reasons I think this is so important for us is that it's a place where we discover just how practical our faith is. In the 17 years now that I've been working as a Catholic priest, I, it always astounds me to see just how ready we are as Christians to keep Christ in the church and to keep our religion behind closed doors instead of bringing it actively into the very places where we ourselves are called to deliver and to perform and to make things happen. It's almost like the phenomenon of the closed doors, right? That we read about with the, or the early church, where after the resurrection of Christ, they locked themselves out of fear into, you know, be, being behind closed doors. I'm like, this is still the same thing we're doing today. Here, the, the society around us doesn't know what's left from its right in many ways, is no longer aware of what's right or wrong, or even willing to say what's right or wrong, even when it comes to things as essential as the value of human life, for example. And yet we Christians are afraid to bring the voice of Christ there. We, we're happy to sing our hymns in our church, to say our, our meal, you know, grace before meals, to, you know, but when it comes to living out our faith as if it was convincing for the world around us, Many of us just kind of stumble. And, and it, that really amazes me because if you look at the number of Christians in America, it's like half of America is a baptized Christian. All right, well then, why aren't we leading the country towards what's right, good, and just? And to be even more you know, practical about it, why aren't we leading our companies towards what's right, good, and just? Why aren't we in our meetings, in our workplaces, talking about how we can put the, the value of the human person and the value of the employees and even the value of our customers even above the value of the bottom line. I mean, in the end, the bottom line is going to increase when you follow you know, the way of the Lord because it's obviously good business, but it's difficult to convince people who are purely materialistic of that and invite a different spirit into the workplace. But most of the time, I don't think it's necessarily because of fear. I think it's because deep down inside, we're not quite confident that there is an advantage and a real practical advantage to approaching our leadership from the point of view of our faith. And that's what I want to discover with you and explore with you. I want to list off the, the very ways that if you got rid of Christianity, if you think of it from the negative perspective, if you got rid of Christianity, what impact would that make upon the workplace? <laughs> and I just want you to think about it for a second, right? If you didn't have a value system that was saying that you should arrive to work on time, that you should give the very best of yourselves, even if you're sick, you know, all of the shoulds that drive what makes a company great, What's going to guarantee those shoulds? Arriving on time, being honest. You should be collaborative. You should look to build up the people around you. You should look to make sure that the person who's underneath you is able to take your place one day. What's guaranteeing those shoulds? And remember, when it comes to business, you all know that those shoulds are what make or break your company. You should, for example, be loyal to a good company that takes good care of you. But, you know, we just kind of shake our heads like, those days are over, Father Nathan. I'm like, oh, wow. Well, if those days are over, it's going to be a lot harder for our companies to succeed. 
And what else is going to happen if those days are over? I mean, is, is, are the days over where you respect your management, where you don't gossip, where you don't tell lies? Are the days over where you don't steal from your company? I mean, right? Like, if those days are over, you know, our goose is cooked. <laughs> Let's just be honest with you. How is it that we can guarantee the culture that guarantees the success of our business? The other day I was talking with a fellow who runs a manufacturing company and he works in Amish, in the Amish country, right? So he's, most of his employees are Amish workers. And he was telling me this is the most extraordinary population to work with. And I said, why is that? And he said, if you were to tell them that they should produce this number, they will strive to produce that number because they're so proud of their ability to work well in a good sense. And if you said that this worker is doing better work than you, they will naturally try to match that worker's quality because they take pride in their work. They don't lie. They, you know, now, of course, we know this is a generalization that every individual is the way that they are. But he was describing his real experience and in, in his joy of finding a workforce that could deliver for him consistently and well, and even you know, with pleasure. Like it was a, a pleasure to work with these people. And I thought, where does that come from? And I asked him and he said, well, the value that they have from their faith drives their work. This is just a real concrete example of wh where is your workforce at with respect to their family life and the value base of them as persons. They're gonna take that value into the workforce. So now, if you take a look at Christianity, what's Christianity's value? Christianity gets behind everything that's authentically human in our relationships. Honesty, compassion, integrity, you know, character development, virtues, and, and even more than that. Uh, it, it gets behind growth and advancement. It gets behind and defends the right of private property, the right for profit, right, that every owner has, that every business has. You know, because of the, also the care for the employees, a safe working environment, all those values. I'm just going to say, remember that the importance of your religion is that it's what maintains those values. It's what defends those values and it's what promotes those values. And if you don't have that, what's going to take its place? Do you really think an economy that's completely driven by materialistic premises is going to be able to maintain a spiritual value system that will then allow businesses to thrive? Absolutely not. And, and when you look at different economic systems and political realities in the past, you can see that the, wherever that's been tried, where you just take a materialistic vision of the human person, you do not get a thriving economy. Because in the end, no government and no economic system and no level of selfishness can produce the collaboration, the sacrifice, the grit, the determination, and the, the focus on quality that you need if you're going to deliver a superior product. And this is why when it comes to Christianity, folks, if we don't step forward and bring Christ's uh, truth effectively through our values and through our work into the workplace and into the economy, we will lose the thing that's made America great and made the West great in general. And if we lose that, we, I think we're going to set ourselves backwards. And I don't think we, any of us really want that. And so when I'm talking about this Christian leadership advantage, I'm telling you this also has a great advantage because it gives you a place where you can allow your faith to become practical. So many Christians that I know end up saying, I just don't even know why I believe. Why is God important? Because what you're focused on is, well, I mean, you're a lawyer. You got you to prepare your cases. You got to prepare your documents. I mean, or I'm a doctor. I've got to take care of my patients. And that's where your focus is. And I'm glad it is. What I'd like to show you, though, is that your faith needs to be able to make what you do every day even more effective. And it can. It can produce an advantage for you. And this is what I want to talk about. So I want to talk today about the advantage of positivity and the worldview of a Christianity that's constantly focusing us forward. And what an amazing gift that is for what we need to do every day in a world that's difficult to, and not always hope-filled. We can be that hope-filled leader when we do it in Christ. Would you like to hear more from Father Nathan? Join the St. John Leadership Network and receive a two-minute glance at the gospel every Sunday morning right to your phone. To learn more, 
go to www.stjohnleadershipnetwork.org slash member and join for free today. So focusing us in on the advantage that Christianity brings to us in our leadership, I, I want to focus in on one particular aspect that I just am enamored with when it comes to Christianity. If you, if you know me a little bit, you know I'm kind of, I, I have a high level of, of energy and drive. And sometimes people ask me, where do you get this from? Why, how do you keep going? Where do you keep getting up with all these ideas and moving forward? And it's always the same thing. I believe in the power of the resurrection. And that the power of Jesus Christ risen from the dead is never going to be exhausted. What that means practically is that when we look at the way that we approach reality, you can look at it saying, well, reality is a material expression of growth, decline, and death. Things are born, things grow, things die, and and then we move on. And is there any really ultimate goal? Well, no, there's no ultimate goal. There's just the next iteration of what is. And if that's the case, well, then what's life all about? Well, it's it's summed up in a beautiful expression that's ancient, of course, is Rome, because that's where it comes from. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we may die, right? And it's like, oh my gosh. And yet, really concretely, isn't that the way that a lot of people live? I mean, eat, drink, and be merry. Like, I'm going to use what I can for today, so I'll just misuse my workers. I won't pay a fair wage. I'll price gouge. I'll, you know, I'll set... And even if it's illegal, I'll break the law here and there. I won't pay my taxes or whatever it is, because in the end, I'm living for me, just like you're living for you. And if each one of us lives for themselves and we don't bother each other, well, then life is good. (laughs) And I'm like, well, that's fine. I guess if you're a pagan, (laughs) so go ahead. That's a very pagan worldview. Okay, because that means that I'm God in the end. And practically, that's where a lot of Christians are, too. I just got to say it. Because if you don't have a God who's practically part of your life where you worship him and you owe him and give him honor and service and glory and sacrifice for him, well, you're going to make yourself practically your own God. And that's a form of paganism. And what flows from that is an ethics that says, hey, whatever gives you pleasure and the most pleasure, as long as it doesn't interfere with anyone else, is a good thing. And we can find all kinds of problems with that. Because while you might be okay, and the next little pagan next door might be okay, the rights of the poor and the vulnerable will not be defended. And we all know from our faith, God hears the cry of the poor. And he takes defense for the defenseless. And so in the end, of course, like we're putting ourselves against God because we don't know how to make him real. Well, I'll tell you how to make him real. Allow a different worldview, his worldview, to drive the way that you interact with the world. Uh, what, what's his worldview look like? Not that eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we may die, you know, and in the end, life is just about what you can take from it. It's very different. Our worldview is I am at the service of a God who is seeking to bring the world to its ultimate perfection and to its final consummation. I am not working in neutrality as a Christian, right? And my Christian faith does not say that what I do is inconsequential. On the contrary, Christianity says we are working to save the world by exerting the influence of Jesus Christ over it, right? And so what's the influence of Jesus Christ? He's the one who heals the sick. He's the one who brings sight to the blind. He's the one who liberates captives. This is amazing God. So I'm going to look at a world, in other words, that might be on a tendency to be fallen, right? Or to be materialistic or self-seeking or divisive or all these things. And I'm going to bring harmony and peace and understanding and compassion. I'm going to develop the heart of the world to be a, a heart that knows God, that goes upward, in other words, instead of downward. Wherever you go downward in, in a, from a worldview, you end up with division. People that can't even unite or understand each other. People that hate the left versus the right. The right versus the left. Everyone against themselves. In a Christian worldview, you have a whole different approach. We say since we have the same end goal, the closer we get to the end point, the closer we get to each other. And what is that end goal? Well, that end goal is defined by our union with God in a robust humanity 
of human hearts that beat together, of innovation, of better products, of better service, a, a world where the poor are lifted up, and, and a world where we share with one another the goods of this earth without denying our right to private property or even to profit, but where we work together because we're working for the same end goal. We have a common purpose, and it's to glorify God in this world. I want to make this point as strongly for everybody, okay? A Christian is a protagonist of history. Okay? It's a big expression, but a protagonist is another word for the hero of the story. And, and a lot of us have a problem with that because we say, I'm not a hero. You know, let's not get a big head about ourselves, etc. I, I want to kind of challenge that worldview because if you don't think that you're a hero or if you're not ready to step into heroism, well, then you're yielding the stage wherever you are to other forces that perhaps are malevolent or at least are not altruistic or at least are not as value-based as you. Wherever you don't shine, you're giving permission for another light to take your place. Is the other light brighter than yours? It might be stronger, but is it brighter, right? There's, an, there's all kinds of people that would just love to have your position of authority. But will they wield it for the freedom and the, and, and the health and the overall advancement of all the people that they're influencing? Or are they going to wield it instead for manipulation, for conquest, for themselves? Do you see, like, if you have a worldview that says, I am, practically speaking, the end goal of my own life, and I'm here just to protect and advance myself, you put that person in a position of leadership, and what are they going to do with all of the goods that are there, with all the people that are, they're going to use them for themselves, which means they're going to be a kind of tyrant instead of a king. A king, says Thomas Aquinas, rules the people for their good, and he sees his role as that of a servant for the people that he is serving. Whereas a tyrant rules the situation for their good and sees the people as means to his own end. Okay, so what's going to guarantee that kingly service, that kingly attitude? Right? Only someone who says, I'm doing this for the sake of a, better, of a better end. Something that's bigger than me, that we're moving forward. And that that has been guaranteed by Christ and his resurrection. And my job is to bring the power of that resurrection directly to bear here. Now, think of the practicality of this. If you're going to hire somebody, wouldn't you want to hire a manager who believes in the resurrection and who believes in the goodness that, that can be done through what you're accomplishing there? Who believes in the quality of your product and the quality of your service? Because he sees it as a reflection of the hopefulness of the world? Of course you would. Because you're like, that person's going to produce. In good times and in bad, they're going to make stuff happen because they're a fighter. Right? You take away that power of the resurrection. You say in the end, nothing really matters. And then hire a manager who believes that nothing really matters. Well, they're going to think that their business doesn't matter either. There's a practical advantage to Christian faith when it comes to leadership and it's that a christian leader fights moves forward deals with brokenness confronts what's wrong because they know they can make it better and that type of leader is just extraordinary not only for business but for the family as well would you like to start your thursday mornings with a scriptural leadership lesson join the saint john leadership network where Father Nathan hosts a 30-minute call at 6.30 a.m. in all four U.S. time zones. To learn more, go to www.stjohnleadershipnetwork.org slash member and join for free today. So when it comes to Christian optimism, there's been a lot that's said that sometimes a little bit on the, on the, the trifling side, you know, of, of the story, things that just don't seem very consequential, kind of like a, a pop psychology approach. And it's not bad, you know, to think of positive thinking, positive mindset, manifesting, you know, positivity into the universe or whatever people want to talk about. Uh, you know, I, I'd like to approach it from a little bit of a more substantial tack, right? And to say that when it comes to Christian optimism, we believe that the world is in the hands of God. And being in the hands of a benevolent, loving God who is all-powerful and all-good, 
that God is going to operate in the world to bring the world to a better place. That might sound trite. It's not at all. In fact, it has a lot of repercussions for our view of history and our view of ourselves as leaders who are creating history, who are the protagonists of history, who are making things happen. Right? Because if I believe that God has the world in his hands, that he's all good and all loving, and that he's also all powerful, and then I believe that I am at his service, what am I going to do? I'm going to take my limited power and my limited goodness, to be honest with you, but I'm going to deploy my limited power at the service of what I see as really being good. And that requires an energy a sacrifice, a determination, a vision, a skill set, right? That pushes me forward. And as I push to say, you know what? It'd be a lot easier to be selfish. It'd be a lot easier to just let my employees go. It'd be a lot easier to not innovate my business and to be lazy. It'd be a lot easier to be at a meeting and not say anything. Why? Because I'm getting a paycheck anyway. You know, put yourself back in the high school when you're trying out for the soccer team. You know, you might have you know 20 guys who are just, who are jogging. You don't have to win. You do not have to come in first, second, or third in that tryout. You just have to not lose. So you just can't be the last three on, on the trap. But if you're in the middle pack, you're going to be fine. And you know this, so you don't exert yourself the extra, extra energy to try to win. You just make sure that you're in the middle with everyone else. And we do the same thing at work. We say, well, you know, I don't have to say anything because it's not my meeting anyway. It's not my responsibility. Well, you're going to be a mediocre worker. And what happens when you're a mediocre worker? You deliver mediocre work. And if your company stays mediocre long term, of course, it's negative. But we're all looking to cash out early. That's just not a Christian understanding of things. A Christian says, I'm here to do the best work that I can every day. Because I'm not here just for the company. I'm here for God. And if I'm serving God, then I'm going to give the best that I can. Well, of course, that means that in a meeting, in a situation, everywhere you're going to rise in your leadership. And, and bosses know this. If, you don't, if you're not an owner of a company, maybe it's a good example. If you have someone who is or you have someone on the side who, who, who understands, ask them what makes an employee extraordinary. And almost always, it doesn't come to the hard skills. Almost always it comes to their sense of ownership, their sense of, of helpfulness, their sense of natural leadership, where they rise above their peers because they actually care. All right, well, Christian worldview that says that Almighty God has the world in his hands and is moving it forward through me is going to produce Christian people who care. And a Christian person who cares will care about their work. And, I, and, I, and so we see the consequences of that. So how do we go about inculcating this in ourselves? How do we grow in Christian positivity? First point, go back to your faith in the resurrection of Christ from the dead. The incredible power of the resurrection is that Jesus entered into every form of defeat, everything that could bring us down from physical suffering to betrayal, to rejection, to political persecution, to poverty, everything that could bring us down. And he literally overcame every one of those obstacles by the inner power of his love for God, even death him itself. Death was undone when the father raised Jesus from the dead and established him as a principle of life, right? And therefore of perfection, of fulfillment that will never die. Well, we who are operating in the workforce, we who are leading in this world or are engaged in the practical affairs of society are supposed to have been baptized into that resurrection so that whatever we do flows from this principle of victory, of life, of understanding of God that can never be undone, never be overcome. That, that, well, that, might, that means that when I face the real challenges of my day and the real defeats and the real hits, nothing is ever final. You know, uh, failure is not final. It's the courage to continue that counts. Why would you have courage to continue when you're constantly being, you know, uh, suffering an onslaught of, of de defeat or of difficulty? 
I have the courage to continue because I know that in the end, this world is in the hands of God and that he is more powerful than every evil. And so my job is to do all the good that I can for as many as I can for as long as I can. I'm going to use every opportunity that I have and leverage it in this worldview that says we have overcome all that could hold us back. And, and of course, if, if we do this as a society, well, then we do overcome. You're only defeated when you quit. Now, there's times where you've got to stop what you're doing, sell your business, move, shift, pivot. That's not quitting. That's fighting in a different angle. When you quit is when you allow in your heart, when you allow negativity and defeatism or materialism or selfishness to take the place of that radiant freedom that Christ died to give you. The freedom and energy that says, I'm only passing through this world. And so I'm here to do some damage for the good. I'm here to lift people up, to heal, to reach out, to harmonize, to move us forward towards a greater advancement, both spiritual and economic. Because I believe in the goodness of the good things that are to come. I'm a Christian. I'm pushing forward to heaven and I'm bringing heaven to this earth as much as I possibly can. And you can't stop me because the one whom I serve has risen from the dead and he has sent me into this world as his missionary and as his leader. And therefore, every influential aspect of my life is going to be leveraged at his service to bless this world, to bless it, to bring you and everyone around me into the knowledge that life is good. It should be good and that we can all together advance in harmony towards something even better than what we've got right now. I believe in positivity because I come from a God who is risen from the dead. Dare great things for Christ. Share your feedback with Father Nathan. Send us an email at communications at stjohninstitute.org. That's communications at stjohninstitute.org. And visit www.stjohninstitute.org and sign up for our newsletter to receive updates from Father Nathan.